All right, everybody. So today we are on to topic 7.2. This is the causes of World War One. So we're going to go over a real brief kind of what happens and the underlying and immediate cause for World War One. Uh, but there's also going to be an assignment that's going to be dive into a little more detail. And, and it's a historian's perspective of kind of how each individual country does play a role in the, the outbreak of World War One itself. But let's go over some basics here real quick. So your central question for this lecture is to what extent did for uh, death of Franz Ferdinand uh, cause World War One? All right. So we'll talk about him towards the end and such. But in the immediate, um, we're going to talk about the underlying causes as well. How big a role do they play in the actual outbreak of World War One? So uh, the language of the curriculum says the causes of World War One included imperialist expansion and the competition for resources. In addition, Territorial and regional conflicts combined with a flawed alliance system and intense nationalism to escalate the tensions into global conflict. Let's break this down a little more simply. So really, when we look at the causes of World War One, we tend to use the acronym as history teachers as the main, the main causes of the, the war. And that includes militarism, alliances, imperialism and nationalism. Um, and I want to go back to this real quick. So. You know, we often like to think about the 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 whole underlying concept like the the powder keg and such. Okay, it's creating this this enormous amount of tension within Europe, and then eventually there's going to be a spark that lights this powder keg and it explodes. Okay, so that's kind of where the picture is is supposed to be a symbol of the idea of these underlying causes are really what help drive us towards World War One. So let's start with militarism. So militarism, what is it? It's the glorification of build-up armed forces, right? And you've been seeing this in, in the industrializing countries for some time. The British built, you know, a very, very powerful navy. Um, the Germans built a very strong and powerful army. And so, you know, when you are looking at the idea of militarism, you know, the, the idea is that military equals greatness, right? And if you recall, when we read ABCs for Baby Patriots, that is projected in that book where it talks about their Navy, you know, rules the oceans and things like that. So this is something that was promoted and, and glorified within these countries is the, having the great military strength. Because really, um, you know, having great military, this idea of hard power, it allows for much more influence around the world. It allows more imperialism and other things to, to incur. Um, and so they want respect. They want fear from other countries. And the best way to get that is having a mighty military. So you're going to end up with, you know, especially towards the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, um, you know, these arms races that will um, occur between countries to try to have the large standing armies or navies that are ready to mobilize quickly for war. Um, you know, the industrial might that they have can now produce, mass produce weapons of, of mass destruction for that era. Um, you know, artillery, new types of artillery, machine guns, all those things are going to play a significant role in this war. Um, but helping arm more men with more supplies and more efficient killing weapons uh, is all part of this whole militarism and one of the major underlying causes for when it breaks out. Because if you're an army and you have all this new equipment and this, you know, you think that your military is far superior, you're going to want to prove it at some point. So I think that metaphorically, like a lot of these countries end up getting what we call the itchy trigger finger. They're just ready to pull it to see what would happen. So the next major reason is alliances. And so an alliance is basically an association of countries that agree to come to each other's defense who, um, you know, when they are attacked or, um, you know, threatened in any way. So many of the alliances that uh, do a, a form uh, that play a role in what will eventually be a cause of World War One, formed after the 1870 Franco-Prussian War. In that war, uh, Germany was able to take control of territory away from France. Uh, and, uh, you know, that didn't sit well uh, in the long run, obviously. And so, you know, fearing that there would be another war, um, the French are going to, um, well, we'll start with the Germans. They, they established this. The Germans were uh, concerned with the possibility that France would want to try to take that land and territory back from them. So they formed an alliance known as the Triple Alliance with Italy, Germany, and themselves, and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
which is the empire that's right here in Central Europe. Um, France uh, is going to respond to that by you know, signing to their own alliance known as the Triple Entente. So they signed an alliance with Russia, and of course Russia and France were basically on both sides of Germany, so that's a threat to Germany itself. And they also wanted Great Britain to join this, but Great Britain, essentially why it's called the Entente, is basically that's the idea of a gentleman's agreement. So they, uh, they, they don't sign anything like a specific, we will absolutely come and help you. It's a more of a hard maybe. If you if it's in our interests of ourselves, then yes, we would come help you. But if not, then pretty much you're on your own, right? So this is kind of how like you know these alliance systems do form. But over time, you know, new alliances with including different countries will form in the war itself, and they'll become known as the Central Powers, which will include Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then the Ottoman Empire. And then the Allied powers, which will include Great Britain, France, Russia, and later the United States. All right. And that's what, you know, the, what it kind of boils down to by the time that the, the war is, is underway. So, all right. The next cause is imperialism. We've talked about imperialism a lot in, in, in the recent units and such. You know, we have all these countries that are all scrambling to take territory um, in Africa, Southeast Asia, Oceania, um, you know, and, and then this is also the economic imperialism we talked about to boot. Um, but the military and economic domination over other countries, you know, all of these European countries were competing for territorial holdings. And it intensified conflicts over time. We talked about the Berlin Conference in 1884 that helped kind of find a diplomatic solution so that all large scale wars wouldn't uh, break out over the scramble for Africa. But, you know, that is, you know, end up being a temporary thing. Um, but, you know, territorial holdings was another thing that kind of adds into that idea of military and, and industrial and, and national strength. And so that is something that, uh, you know, every one of these countries continues to look at how can they wrestle control of the territories away from other countries. And that's going to be another one of the major underlying causes of the, the war itself, because when war does break out, some countries like Germany feel like it's their opportunity to, to kind of prove that they are uh, capable of, you know, taking more territory away from other countries. And that's just one of the major causes. Oops, what happened here? Okay. So, uh, I'm just doing my, this on my computer at home school. Okay. The last major underlying cause is nationalism. And so nationalism is that deep devotion and pride in one's country. Again, referring back to the ABCs for baby patriots, you see a lot of nationalistic uh, uh, tones within that little children's book itself. You know, Great, the be Great Britain's the best and, and, and there's no country that can compare to us. And, and a lot of European countries felt this way um, about their, their culture, their, their country. And we talked about things like civilizing missions, you know, they happen because people felt that their way of life was superior to the way of life of other peoples. And then the same thing happened here, the competition between European countries, you know, Germany and Germans felt that they were a far superior people and, and culture and country to Great Britain and Great Britain probably felt the same way about themselves. Um, but you, you know, in all these cases, you, you know, believe yourself to be superior militarily, culturally, economically, hey, even politically, you know. So these are the things that they, um, you know, this is the mindset they're taking into this, this whole when when things start to break out, you know, a lot of them are out to prove that their country is superior to others. So. All right. So those are a lot of the underlying causes that play a role in why the war happens. But let's talk about some specific events that kind of lead up to the war. So 1908, the Ottoman Empire loses some control of Bosnia uh, to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Of course, this is imperialism at work, right? So Serbia is another one of those Balkan nations um, that had um, become independent from the Ottoman Empire. Serbia um, supported the ethnic Slavs, uh, which is the, the ethnic group that they identified with, um, in Bosnia and wanted Bosnia to become independent, uh, an independent country, same as Serbia. 
Now, the Russians would support Serbia because they are um, both Slavic descendants of Slavic people. Um, in fact, Russia saw themselves as like the, the mother country of, of, of the Slavs. Um, and so this whole idea of pan-Slavism, which is kind of plays in that nationalist role, um, Russia believes that all Slavic people should be able to be free independent and, and Russia should be the, you know, the, the, the mothership or so to say of, of the Slavic people that they, um, you know, could kind of exert influences around the world. Uh, hegemon is the best way of putting it, um, where they're like the most powerful country in that region or I've been, yeah. but anyway, I divert. Um, Meanwhile, the Archduke of, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, meaning that he was next in line to be the emperor of the empire, um, Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie are going to go and visit the capital of Bosnia, the place is called Sarajevo. And the, the goal was supposed to be, when he goes to visit, was supposed to try to extend an olive branch, um, you know, to show that he is, you know, kind and, and caring person, yada, yada. Um, but, you know, this mission of goodwill is not going to be met without problem. And so one of the issues was that there was a terrorist group, um, terrorist or freedom fighter, whatever, however perspective you see it, but um, they were known as the Black Hand. And the Black Hand were um, probably supported by the Serbian government. Um, but the goal was that they wanted to try to set in motion um, you know, events that would hopefully lead to the independence of Bosnia. And so the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand um, is going to happen. And, and while driving around, so first of all, there was a parade for the Archduke. It was published in the newspaper. He sat in an open top vehicle. And so the Black Hand thought this would be easy. And uh, so what ends up happening is that the parade happens. They throw a bomb at the car. It bounces off and misses. It does blow up another car that had some of the soldiers and bodyguards that were with the Archduke. Um, the Archduke gets away and he survives, um, but he goes back out to the hospital to visit the soldiers that were injured in the bombing. But while driving around Sarajevo, um, the driver gets lost and uh, takes a wrong turn and ends up in this open top car right next to one of the members of the Black Hand, a guy named Gravilio Princip. Um, who will gun down Archduke Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie. And this is the event that really sparks and blows that powder keg up because now it's going to trigger all the events that lead to World War I. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire is uh, you know, justifiably angry at, at Serbia because they believe that Serbia was... Um, the ones who were responsible for the the Black Hand and and funding them and and training them and so forth, and they may have had a hand in it. Uh, there's all very likelihood that they did. So they send this very long list of impossible demands to Serbia. Um, I think it's in the high twenties of a number of demands, and there was only one that they did not agree to, and so. When that happened, Austro-Hungarian Empire goes to their friends and allies in Germany and says, if, if we uh, declare war on Serbia and attack them, will you get our back? And Germany says yes. So that's what happens. And um, when that occurs, Russia, who was in an alliance with uh, the Serbs, uh, ends up declaring war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And when that happens, Germany declares war on Russia. When Germany declares war on Russia, Russia then declares war, or, or, sorry, uh, Germany declares war on Russia, France then declares war on Germany. And this all kind of, you know, unfolds and triggers this whole alliance system um, very quickly. And so now you have most of Europe that's engulfed in a war. The United Kingdom decides not to join. Uh, for the time being. Um, but the Ottoman Empire does join the Central Powers almost immediately because they see this as an opportunity to try to regain that territory in the Balkans. Um, and essentially, World War I has begun. Now, the UK will eventually join the war. Um, and that's stuff that uh, we don't really talk too much about right now because 
Um, I don't want to get into the details of World War One until we get to the next one. But ultimately, they do decide to join on the side of the French and the Russians because the Germans will invade France through the neutral country of Belgium. And this is what's going to spark the UK into it eventually. OK, so. That is it in a nutshell, and the, the assignment's going to get into some more details about how every country does play some role in blame in for why the World War I does happen. Um, but it is up to the uh, to you as, as, as little historians to try to figure out um, and, and analyze who is ultimately responsible. And then remember, history is not always there's a right answer. It's about perspective at times. So this is kind of one of those assignments that gives you the perspective of one historian's interpretation, but you can also see things in a little different light as well. Different from me, if you need to. So here is your uh, essential question one more time. And so make sure that you do this and uh, submit it to on Canvas. And then um, after you do this, uh, if you are taking my class. Um, if you're not, you don't have to worry about this. But if you are, then make sure you do the assignment about um, who caused World War One. So that's it from Mr. Henry. I'll see you next time.